this is due to ship uh, two weeks from today, so fairly imminently we're just into the final regression leg and the packaging and productization. Um, it comes fairly hot on the heels of the 11.4 release back in early summer. So just to give you an idea of what's coming, um, adoption of OpenJDK 11, and obviously I'm going to explain that, sounds a bit technical and isn't really something that an end user will uh, see much difference in. This is really about the development platform, but there are a number of implications uh, for us adopting this technology uh, as in our development environment. And we've got some enhancements in the online editor as well as some user experience refinements. There is now a new button uh, at the top of the screen for downloading a target file, which we'll see later on in the demo. We've added support for two new file types, uh, Photoshop and Markdown. Uh, Photoshop has been around for many years. This is obviously an uh, Adobe product for image manipulation. And often people put text in layers in their image files, and we now support extracting that and presenting it for translation. Markdown is a relatively new uh, format. It's supposed to be a simplified version of uh, HTML. It allows uh, non-technical users to create uh, content with formatting very much uh, like HTML and presentable in a browser, and we now support that. And then, of course, we have our usual item of customer satisfaction bug fixes, as it says here. So OpenJDK 11, um, as it says here, and again, it's a little bit technical, this one, but uh, it's an, it has important consequences, as I've mentioned. It's an open source fork of the Java platform, and it says uh, not the Oracle Java version, i.e. not paid. So what happened on January 1st this year, uh, Oracle, who owns the Java uh, development language, and decided that the, they would be charging a license fee for software houses that developed uh, their own applications using uh, later versions of Java. We were we stayed on Java 8, which was the last unpaid version uh, for the 11.4 release, but we were duty bound then to upgrade, and we did that to use the open source uh, JDK 11. So we went straight from version 8 to version 11. Uh, being the, an open source version, it's not tied to any individual technology. Therefore, third-party JREs, such as Amazon's Coretto, uh, can also be used to run uh, World Server when necessary. Um, we are not formally qualifying any of these third-party vendors. There's already a proliferation of them, and it would massively uh, expand our uh, QA and regression matrix of different variables. So we have different operating systems, different database technologies, and all of these different JREs. So we've taken the decision not to formally qualify them, but you can be assured that if they are open JDK 11 compliant, that you should have no issues running the server within them. Um, it's an interesting business decision that uh, Oracle took since they had a, basically a monopoly on this and have now uh, opened, well, the, the open source branch was already there, but they've uh, added a license fee, and many, many software houses have taken the same decision that SDO has taken to adopt this open um, platform rather than the paid Oracle version. The biggest implication of this, and uh, it's really a benefit rather than a negative, is that the Java applets, uh, we had two remaining in the World Server user interface, are uh, no longer supported, no longer, it's no longer possible to have them. It was already becoming difficult with the more modern, later versions of uh, browsers to load those applets, but we've had to fully uh, rework those things. We uh, taken the business rules applet, so there's a screen for configuring business rules, just to give people an idea of what business rules are, what that feature provides. It's a user interface for configuring things to run on a schedule. So you might have certain operations that you want to run every week, every month, uh, whatever that period might be, uh, the business rules feature allows you to attach some actions to uh, a schedule and it just runs away in the background and takes care of those things that you've configured. There are a number of out-of-the-box actions and clauses. Um, there are uh, many more possibilities available with this feature extensions uh, using the SDK so that you can then create some custom code and custom clauses and do all kinds of uh, operations, whatever they might be. I've got a couple of examples later on in the, the demo. The basic structure of a, a business rule, so you perform an action if a certain condition is met, unless another condition is met, 
and it runs on a schedule every, as I said, any configurable period. There is also an option to create these rules and have them not run automatically uh, every so often, but rather only when you want to manually execute them. And here is a screenshot of the old business rules wizard, as you can see, as well as being an applet, which is difficult to load in modern browsers, is also uh, difficult to read. Um, one of the things that we've been doing as we've been replacing the old applet technology with a new user interface is also improving the user experience. And you'll see on the next screen a much neater, uh, more presentable uh, view of how to configure a business rule. So you have all of the options, the clauses and conditions on the left-hand side. And then as you click through those, selecting various parameters and options, you'll see in the top right a nice uh, human-readable summary of the things that you've been configuring on the left-hand side. Uh, again, the, just to go back, this is how it used to look, and here's how it looks now. It's obviously a huge improvement from a user's perspective. The other applet that we have uh, had to deal with as a result of that uh, adoption of the Open JDK 11 is World Server Explorer. And here's a short summary. It provides a UI for accessing the asset interface system. So it allows you to interact with files, upload files, download files. Also, you can change properties, uh, the TM or the TM group associated with a particular um, path in AIS. And there are quite a number of options there. It is really, uh, to my mind, a, a legacy way of working and interacting with World Server. There are pretty much uh, new features, especially in the new user interface, that allow you to achieve all of the things that you could do with Explorer. But we do know that many people continue to use it. Um, what we've done in this case, rather than rebuild that in a new UI page, we've actually ported the applet code into a full desktop application. Uh, using the Java FX framework. And we, of course, have made this available for both Windows and Mac OS. We know that we have users uh, on both of them. So here's uh, how it looks. You launch it up, sorry, and then you obviously have to log in. So you specify the URL for your World Server instance, your credentials. And then you see this is an application now. It looks almost identical to the UI that you get in, um, in the old applet version. And that's because we've taken this decision simply to port the code over. It is obviously an application UI rather than an applet UI. So it's a little bit richer in terms of the controls that you get. But essentially, all of the functionality is retained as it was in the applet version. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have uh, added support for two new file types, as well as the, these two new additions. We've obviously updated all of the existing file types, as uh, you should be aware by now. With every release of World Server, when we're updating the FTS components, we take the latest versions of all of the file type support that we have. Uh, this align, uh, allows us to align with, uh, in particular, Charles Studio, so the latest version there. Uh, has the same version of these file types uh, that you've seen in World Server 11.5. But specifically, the new ones that we've added are su to support Photoshop. Um, there are three different extensions that you can see there and uh, an array of different versions of Photoshop that we support. Uh, I guess the key uh, point to make here is that there is no currently no user interface in World Server for uh, configuring the file type options. In this case, it's not such uh, a big deal. There is only one option, as it mentions here, whether to include hidden content or not. But the way to make the settings changes that you might need is to configure that in Trado Studio and export those as a settings bundle and then import them through the World Server UI. So this situation is, uh, I guess, driven by the other piece of legacy UI technology, the Silverlight pages that we currently have for file type configurations that we will in a future release be removing from uh, the application the same way that we did with uh, the applet pages. But for now, uh, I thought it better to implement support for these file types, even though there is no native UI in World Server, but there is obviously a mechanism to get your settings changes uh, in, in Trial Studio. Same is true from Markdown. So there are a couple of extensions there. It also further supports embedded content processing, as you can see in a little screenshot. Uh, that's taken obviously from Trial Studio, 
and there are a couple more options but again it's not so many as you might see for uh, other file types uh, the office formats or XML or any of those is a relatively well defined and discrete uh, discreetly understood file formats there isn't much variation in there um, because I guess the Photoshop is not really about text it's an image format but there is the possibility to put text in there and Markdown is a as I mentioned at the beginning intended to be a simplified way of presenting uh, text to a user and therefore it again has fewer uh, configuration again the story is you can figure that in Trello Studio export those and import them into world server okay so I'll go straight into the demo here I'm going to show you usage of the uh, new business rule pages so you launch it up obviously from the same location within uh, the world server UI when you get to so I'm going to load the rules list page now you can see many rules uh, and then I'm going to create a new one you can see uh, that was that much neater more presentable user interface and this one is going to alert me for overdue tasks as you'll see as I go through and make the specifications the rule summary is updated as I select various options so if a task is due within a particular number of days in this case I've chosen two then I can perform an action if this condition is true if you remember the structure is if the condition is true do this action except if some condition is also true so I'm going to email the project creator if there are any tasks in the system when this rule executes that are within two days of their due date and I'm going to run it on a daily basis wouldn't make any sense to run it on any other kind of schedule and there you go I've created that rule and now what will happen is uh, every day it will check for that those conditions and uh, send that email out to the project creator so it's just a warning for the, the project creator here's another example of a rule in this one I'm going to interact with terminology so this is not an out-of-the-box set of conditions and clauses as I mentioned there are very rich possibilities for uh, configuring actions and decision points using the world server SDK so I'm going to select term base and for certain locales and then I'm going to specify uh, a particular term status so what will happen when this rule executes it will interrogate that term base and look at the terms within the selected locales and then if it finds any uh, terms that have a proposed status it will actually then initiate a term validation project so that's one of the um, I guess important features within terminology databases within world server is you can create a workflow based project that is all about validating terminology this one I've set to run manually only because the idea of adding new proposed terms to your terminology database is not something that you would do necessarily on a daily basis okay the new file types this is an example of markdown and this is the equivalent in HTML as you can see it's intended to be a simplified version of that so it uses kind of indents and uh, ASCII underlines to represent um, the formatting that you can put into HTML if you understand that thing here you can see markdown file type and the import option as I mentioned this is the one that you must use if you are have any uh, settings that are not the defaults you know I'm showing an example also of the markdown file type being used to process the files so I've created a project here with the various different extensions I'm going to open it in the online editor and here you can see it's obviously a, a test file where you would are testing all of the different features I'm going to confirm that segment and you can see it auto propagating very nicely it's one of the differentiators from the old browser workbench of course and, and then uh, you can see obviously there is some WYSIWYG representation even though it's a markdown file you we are representing links as links there I am using that new button as I mentioned earlier there we are now able to download the target file and you can see the modifications that I've made in there I'm going to jump to the last of the videos now and this is about world server explorer here I'm going to the explorer page and here now you have a link uh, both to windows and the mac os versions it's a relatively large download as you can see it's 171 megabytes 
but it's only uh, one off so you download and install this as I mentioned it runs as a fully fledged application and is no longer an applet in the browser so once you uh, have installed this you'll see an entry in the control panel you'll have an entry in your start menu for example on Windows and then when you launch that you then put in your URL your user credentials and you can see here it's opened on the other screen but I'll drag it over you'll see Explorer um, pretty much as you would see it in the browser with the applet version you can resize things you get some nice controls all of the menu options that you had are all available here also in the application version and you can interact with various m the mount points you can create folders and you'll see me do that in a moment and then uh, pretty much everything that you could do in the old Apple version you can do also in this but you uh, obviously don't need to open the browser page and struggle to launch it it's running now as a fully fledged application and here you can see we're loading the kind of legacy UI uh, from that application where you get all of the same uh, options available to you. Here I am setting some file type options for this particular AIS property. And again, you can see here I've set it and we've returned. Okay, so that was uh, the short demo of the, I guess, the three key takeaways that were um, deliverables that were including the 11.5. Um, I have a little bit more to talk about as well related to World Server 11.6. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the 11.5 came fairly hot on the heels of the 11.4, and we do like to have this more rapid release cycle now using our agile development methodologies. This means also that 11.6 has a relatively bounded scope, uh, essentially three uh, areas that we're improving and extending. There will be uh, a new counter so that every time a segment is leveraged from a TM during the pre-processing phase, segmentation and TM lookup, we will increment a counter. This allows you to measure uh, over time the value of the segments within your translation memory. Um, obviously, the, one of the key ROI points for a TM is the reuse. And if a segment has been created five years ago and has never been used, that means it's never been the best match during that pre-processing phase. You might want to consider archiving those segments away, for example, so you reduce the size of your TM so that they're much faster uh, to do per perform much faster performance to do the lockups against. Um, there is a flip side to that as well. Because we can count that, we can also count per TM uh, how many segments were matched, and we're going to include that in the task history. There's a couple of screenshots to illustrate this. Second key area is around exporting translation kits. This also relates to TM usage because we also perform that TM lockup again. So that counter from the first bullet point here will not be incremented every time you export a kit. It's only incremented at the segment asset phase. But still, currently, in the current world server, you are uh, performing that TM lookup again, which for large projects and large TMs uh, could lead to very long uh, export times and user frustration. So we are adding the ability to cache the TM results from the initial segment asset step and simply reuse those, inject them into the package uh, that the translator downloads, and it's much, much faster. We're also adding a, a second option simply to create a kit with the bilingual files and any attributes that might be there, but with no project TM. This was a user requested item. Um, and again, that will be a much faster uh, export option. And uh, as always, uh, we will be updating the online editor with every release. E deliverable, there's a couple of features, find and replace, uh, again, the long requested, user requested item. But one of the key gaps that we have right now is the lack of integration with World Server terminology databases, and we're going to close that gap with the 11.6 release so that you can get TM, uh, sorry, TD matches uh, when you're uh, uh, working in the online editor. Here's a nice screenshot showing that the segment asset step is completed, and we will list out if there were three TMs in the group as there are here. It will tell you per TM how many segments. Uh, were matched from each TM and then we record that obviously that usage count against the TM entry itself.
So a very nice way of keeping track of the value of the assets within World Server. Uh, here's a nice screenshot showing the export dialog. Uh, again, you see the new options that we're implementing. So use cache TMX and then SCLX with only, so no TM at all. And then finally, uh, terminology matching. So we already have TM matching, and we're going to we're using the same pane on the right hand side here to show also terminology matches. This is obviously a trivial example of some test files, but the key thing that you can see here is terminology matches feed into um, this little drop down that appears, which you can then use the keyboard to select the term match and insert it directly into the segment so that you don't even have to type it in if it's uh, available for you through the terminology database. So again, a smaller scale release, but some really valuable features, I think, and uh, the idea of having a shorter release cycle is that we can get this value out into the market, and obviously the efficiency gains that these things provide uh, will help you work better and more efficiently yourselves. And that is the end of the presentation. I don't know. Do we have any questions in the Q&A box for today? No questions have come in so far. If you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A window and we can answer it now. We'll just wait a couple of minutes and see if we get any questions come in. <laughs> No, it doesn't look like we've got any questions come in. It's been all very clear. Exactly. If you do have any questions after the webinar, then please do get in touch. Um, so thanks, Ray, for presenting today, and Pleasure. thanks for attending today's webinar. Uh, recording will be available shortly, um, but we will actually be sending out the recording to everybody that is registered to attend. I uh, just want to say we hope you found today's um, session useful, and we look forward to welcoming you on another one of our webinars. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.